for your patience while we take a break. Next item on the agenda, number 21, request, request authorization to issue a scoping determination waiving the requirement of further review pursuant to Article 80, Section 80B-5.3D of the Zoning Code for the construction of 219 residential units, including 29 IDP rental units, ground floor bicycle storage spaces, um, 129 garage parking spaces located at 780 Morrissey Boulevard, to recommend approval to the Board of Appeal for zoning relief and to take all related actions. Stephen. Uh, good evening again, and thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Madam Secretary and Director Golden. My name is Stephen Harvey, and I'm a project manager at the BBDA, and I wanna thank you for your time again tonight. The project I bring before you today is 780 Marcy Boulevard. The project site is located in Dorchester, a neighborhood within Boston. On November 18, 2019, I received a letter of intent from the Michaels organization, the proponent, proposing an Article 80 large project at the 780 Marcy Boulevard site. On February 3rd, 2020, the Boston Planning and Development Agency received a project notification form from the proponent expanding on the details of the proposed project. The Michaels organization proposed to construct a residential building housing 219 rental units with 136 parking spaces. The project site was the location of a neighborhood restaurant, the Freeport Tavern. The single story structure building, the Freeport Tavern still exists at the proposed project site today and will be demolished for the proposal. If approved, the new structure will again contain 219 rental units, 29 of those units being ID, IDP units. The proponent is providing a list of mitigation and community benefits this ranges from public realm improvements to funding a bike um, share station on site. Topping the list of contribution, the proponent will make a $100,000 contribution to fund near term design efforts for Tinian Beach improvement and Connell Street improvements and a deployable gate as contemplated in the Climate Ready Dorchester report. Regarding public engagement, we have we've had in-person IAG meetings on March 10th. We had an in-person IAG meeting on March 10th and a virtual IAG meeting on November 18th. We also had two virtual public meetings, one on August 11th and the other meeting on November 18th. Both virtual public meetings were advertised in the Dorchester Reporter. With all that said, I would like to pass it over to Jay Russo from the Michaels organization and Brian O'Connor from Cube3. Um, they will run through the project presentation and will answer any questions put forward. Thank you for your time again. Thank you, Stephen. Madam Chair, members of the board, Madam Secretary and Director Golden, my name is Jay Russo. I'm here representing the Michaels organization. I'm joined today with our partners from the Phillips Group and our talented development team. We're very excited uh, about this project and I'm pleased to be given this opportunity to present to you today. Uh, I'll be very brief. I'd like to thank Stephen and the rest of the BPDA staff. COVID uh, certainly imp uh, impacted our community process, but through everyone's hard work, we were able to complete the process. Uh, we hope that you'll see through uh, the project that we're about to present. Um, the project benefited greatly from the comments of the staff BCDC, elected officials, and especially the community in the IAG. At this time, I'd like to just turn it over to, to Brian O'Connor and Cube3, uh, and we'd make ourselves available to answer any questions at the end. Great, thank you, thank you, Jay. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, Brian O'Connor from Cube3. I'm, I'm gonna try to go fairly rapidly here and, and stay as succinct as possible. Uh, and, and at the same time cover the ground. I know it's been a long afternoon. So just, just very quickly, um, the site we're talking about is, is outlined in, in red uh, in the upper left-hand corner. And as you can see on the right, it's a, it's a fairly prominent site along the Route 93 corridor on the south side of the city adjacent to the Ramada Inn um, and across from the harbor there. So you can see in the lower left is a quick image of the site um, looking across Morrissey Boulevard uh, it's a fairly open site in its existing condition with uh, small 
restaurant on site and, and a significant amount of surface parking. Uh, next slide, please. This is a photo down Freeport Street, which is the adjacent street uh, running parallel in some respects to Morrissey and then connecting to it as a frontage road. This is the existing restaurant on site. And, and as you can see that, uh, you know, we're really looking forward to the opportunity to improve the public realm along the front edge of the street here. Uh, next image, please. This is just another shot showing the the balance of the lot is being used as car storage right now. So, you know, right now it's just a very large uh, surface parking lot. Next. From the Route 93 corridor looking down into the site, um, we're really looking at the leading edge of the site on the north side here where those entrance gates are. That's actually adjacent property ours. Uh, and then again, you can see the balance of the site beyond. Uh, in this image, you can see Freeport. And one of the things we're really trying to do as part of our, flan our, our plan here is create a strong urban edge along Freeport, which right now is very loose. So next image, please. Just another, another quick shot, we can keep going. So one of the things we really wanted to highlight is all the development in this area. Our site is right in the middle where it says proposed building. And, and as you can see, we've spent a lot of time really thinking about adjacent development parcels that are either up for development in the future, currently on the table now, such as the Herb Chambers uh, Honda dealership, the new salt sheds that are going in. And uh, we've actually borrowed some of the graphics from the Climate Ready Dorchester plan uh, and the DCR to illustrate how important this corridor is and how important the development is here. So you can see the new sort of Morrissey Boulevard development along the uh, western edge of the property at the top of the page and then connecting to the waterfront boardwalk um, that's proposed. And you can see dotted very lightly behind our building is the new DCR multimodal path, which we'll talk about a little bit more in the future. Next slide, please. These are just few quick images of what's going on adjacent to us. So this is the proposed uh, Herb Chambers Honda building and then the salt sheds, which are under construction right now. Uh, next image. So this is really the heart of what we're talking about. Um, this plan has seen just an absolutely tremendous amount of development through our work with the BPDA staff, uh, elected officials, the community and, and everyone else. And what I really wanted to highlight here is sort of some of the core elements of this plan that have really come to fruition through the design process. Uh, Freeport Street runs along the bottom edge of the site and then connects to Morrissey Boulevard, which is unlabeled, but runs parallel on the bottom. The future mass uh, port DCR multimodal path up at the top of the page is running parallel to Route 93. This plan really strove to accomplish a few things. First and foremost, we wanted to really concentrate on the edges of this project, the public realm that we can create along Morrissey Boulevard, the integrated public realm along Freeport Street, the idea of creating a strong and meaningful urban edge to the project and allowing the courtyards to really both embrace views towards the harbor off the page to the top and back into the neighborhood down along the bottom, really engaging Freeport and engaging Morrissey Boulevard. One other important change on this plan from the initial uh, sort of submission and studies is that we move the access point, the public access point to the DCR multi-use path to the right-hand side of the image. And what we're trying to do here is really set the table for future development in the area. So we wanted to think about connecting a very strong public realm space at the intersection of Freeport and Morrissey on the bottom right-hand corner to that multimodal path. And we'll see a few details as we get into the building plans. But the idea was to really make this a very strong, prominent public corridor that is serviced by an, a number of public amenities we'll talk about in a moment. A few other quick key points. Uh, on the left-hand side of this image, you can see the entrance to the parking area. Um, this is a building that has surface parking underneath the building in a podium. And you would access that through uh, Port Cachere along the edge of Freeport Street on the upper left-hand side. We jump to the next slide. Here we can start to see how some of these access points work and some of the core amenities that we're trying to provide. First and foremost, along Freeport, we have a very clear, very well deline delineated and, and positive main entry to the building. Uh, adjacent to that on both sides, creating an active edge to the street is leasing and amenity space for the residents that lives right at that street level. 
And then on the left, we have the entry you can see in, in that dotted purple is how vehicles get into the podium. So they come under the building on the left-hand side and then make a right-hand turn into the parking, which lives really almost completely enclosed within the site. As we move down to the lower right-hand side, I'm sorry, can you go back one slide real quick? On the lower right of this image, you can see we've started to show that public plaza. We've spent a tremendous amount of time developing along Morrissey with multiple public entry points and a very strong connection back to that multi-use path, which includes a public dog park, a large public plaza area, and a very important uh, dedicated bike area for the residents here, which correct, connects directly to that path. Uh, next image, please. We have a few quick sections through the site just to explain a little bit of how the building works. Um, and so we're gonna start on the left and we're gonna move towards the right. We're just gonna cut a few sections. If you can jump to the next slide. The first image actually cuts through that two-story Port Cachere, which I had mentioned. So here we have three levels of residential construction living over a double height opening, allowing a very transparent view corridor from Freeport Street under the building to the DCR path, where we've also provided a pedestrian connection. Here you can see the building beyond, which is running perpendicular to this leg of the building. And then over on the left, you can see where we've indicated Route 93, and the multi-use DCR path, which lives downslope from 93 and is tucked in a really nice space between the edge of the grade and the face of our building. In the next image, we're moving uh, the next slice down. And here you can see the courtyard that we've created for all the residential units that face towards the ocean um, on the left-hand side here. And you can start to see how the building moves down Freeport Street. Here we do have uh, four floors of residential construction over that parking podium. And if we jump to the next one, you can see a section uh, here through the main bulk of the building, which connects from the DCR path all the way through to Morrissey Boulevard. And you can see the parking podium here, which is actually shielded in this location from the edge of that public realm space. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about that in a couple of quick images. If we can move forward, please. This is a quick rendering from across Morrissey Boulevard. So just a few key things to point out on the left-hand side of this image, you can see that two-story uh, Port Cachere space and the transparency and visibility you get through that area. Uh, behind the red van is really where we have the main front door uh, to the building. And you can see that two-story expression, very glassy and welcoming, creating a very active edge. Next image, please. Uh, here you can see a close-up of the main entry, the amenity space to the right and to the left. Here you can see some of the articulation we've started to bring into the building to humanize the scale and bring it down to a more pedestrian-friendly uh, edge. Next, please. This image shows that uh, public realm and plaza space that I was really talking about. And here I wanted to highlight on the right-hand side that public connection that runs down to the DCR path, really bringing... Uh, residents, bikes, there's a blue bike rental station in the front uh, all the way down the path. And here you can start to see, uh, we've really introduced a very important public art component to this area that lives along this wall, wraps down the path. And in the next image, you'll be able to see a little bit more of that as we advance. Uh, one more image you can see, now we're at the Port Cachere looking southbound Route 93 is to our left. And the edge of the building here is really very uh, carefully thought of and articulated so that there are layers from that DCR path back to a very prominent public art edge up to the parking podium uh, where we have that active use above and then back to the building beyond. And the next. And then this is this final image we really have. This is Route 93 North. And here the idea was just to really show you, you know, the articulation of the building creating a very sort of broken down and manageable scale to the building along the highway edge. And I think that's the last image that we have. Great. Yeah, so I, again, just wanted to give you guys a quick overview. We're really excited with uh, where this project has gone through the process, and, and we think we have a, a really, really positive neighborhood contribution here. Great. Thank you so much. Um, questions, comments from the board? Madam Chair, I have a couple of <clears throat> questions, and I know the area very well, but I was trying, trying to, it was getting hard to try to get my bearings there. So the Morrissey Plaza, is that actually on the backside, Freeport Street, what you refer to as the Morrissey Plaza? Uh, 
That that's the Lamberts across across oh. Morrissey. Okay, yeah, I was looking at that image, and I don't want you to go back to it. But when I was looking at yeah. it, it was on the so bottom of my screen. Lambert's shooting across, looking across. <clears> on <throat> okay, and the last slide was actually helpful because I was trying again get my bearings. So the last slide, 93 North. I'm looking at the water. I'm looking at the park out there. There are a lot of people walk their dogs, and that bike path that goes by Tinian on your right hand side. The water's on your right ends, and you got to come underneath the expressway. So. The bike path that you guys are, you're not doing anything on the other side of the expressway. No. 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 Okay. <clears throat> no, but I think it's excellent, by the way. I think the whole project's excellent. <clears throat> It'll be a huge, huge improvement there. But um, you probably already got this. Um, at the corner of Freeport and Morrissey Boulevard, if I cross Morrissey, I'm going over to Freeport Street. If I bang a right, I'm on Morrissey heading downtown. That light is a nightmare. I'm sure you guys know that yes. and, heard, and heard that. What, what's going to be done there? Because you're going to add a couple of hundred units there. Um, that's just going to increase that, you know? Yeah, it's part. I believe as part of our TAPA, we, we've agreed to work on that intersection. Yeah, they should increase that that timer or do something. To, I don't know. It'd be nice to get, get up on the expressway, but I know that's not in the, in the uh, proposal. And... The traffic coming from Tinian, coming from Port Norfolk, currently now, <clears throat> um, is that going to be impeded at all? Because I know you got the Bowling Alley and you know that street that goes goes down to. Um, there's a couple of electrical contractors down there and that whole thing. So a lot of that, their company vans come up, <clears throat> take a right, and pass right by you on that service road before they jump on Morrissey Boulevard. I guess I did not articulate myself well. Yeah, I, I guess I'm, I'm still trying to figure out exactly where you're coming from. But yeah, over in the Norfolk, um, I, I knew we, ha we have Jeff Dirk. Jeff Dirk has been working on our project as well as the, uh, the Herb Chambers project. Um, if, if you don't mind putting him on, he, he may be able to answer. I, I am Jay. Yeah, so, so thank you. So, we've, um, so we're not going to be impeding any of the traffic flow there. I think, in fact... As a part of our TAPA, we are required to uh, complete some design plans that will actually improve that connection that you're speaking of, because it's uh, to say it's a challenge now is an understatement. Um, so we will be advancing some design plans uh, related to that, as well as the improvements that Jay had mentioned. Um, there's work that the city is undertaking along Victory Drive. Right now. Well, yeah, that we'll be working on those improvements um, as well, because they've asked us to more or less partner with them to tie everything in so that you've got better traffic flow, but also safer pedestrian and bicycle connections to get from the neighborhood area across the Long Victory and then connect up to the Neponset River uh, Greenway. The old Sunbeam bread factory. Right. A lot of people come up there from Port Norfolk and bang a right and get on the boulevard yeah. or try and hug behind, which is not a good idea. You're better off staying up if you're going through that intersection. But uh, all in all, I, I think it's a huge improvement and uh, and just some of the particulars I'm sure you're gonna have to work out. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Great, uh, additional comments and questions or question? Okay, hearing and seeing none, uh, a motion is in order. Moved, <clears throat> so moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote, Ms. Downs. Aye. Mr. Monahan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Very cool looking project. Can't wait to ride my bike. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Have a great night. You okay. Um, agenda item number 22. Request authorization to issue a, cer a certification of approval pursuant to Article 80E, small project review of the zoning code for the construction of 19 residential condominium units, including two income restricted units, 19 off street parking spaces and 19 on site bicycle spaces located at 28 through 30 Geneva street to recommend approval to the board of appeal for zoning relief and to take all related actions. Uh, good evening, Madam chair, Dr. Golden, Madam secretary, members of the board. Um, by way of background, on May 16, 2019, this board approved the original iteration of the 28-30 Geneva Street project. 
Uh, as originally approved, the project consisted of the demolition of two existing buildings occupying two parcels of land located at 28-30 Geneva Street in East Boston and the construction of a five-story residential building with 26 condo units, including three IDP units and 19 parking spaces. After going before the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, shortly after the original BPDA approval and as a result of additional community input and review during that process, uh, the proponent filed the project change document with the BPDA uh, seeking to change several elements of the originally approved project. Uh, this project change document was specifically filed with the agency on November 13, 2020 and sought, uh, again, several changes to the project, which included the elimination of approximately 5,160 square feet, the elimination of one floor from the building, uh, one elimination of seven residential units, including one IDP unit, and the reconfiguration of the overall unit mix in the building. Uh, as a result of the proposed changes, the, the proposed project would now until uh, or consists of a four-story residential building uh, comprised of about uh, a little under 18,000 square feet of gross floor area, 19 residential uh, condominium units, including two IDP units, 19 off-street and 19 off-street vehicle parking spaces. Uh, in terms of community process, upon receipt of uh, that document, uh, a public comment period was initiated and concluded on January 3rd, 2021. Uh, during that time frame, the BPDA sponsored and held a public uh, meeting in which the project was the project changes were reviewed and discussed with the community at large. Uh, I'm joined this evening by Matt Echol, who's counsel for the proponent, uh, who will provide you with a brief presentation, and we'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Matt or Jeff, if you're with us tonight. I am here, Roland. Okay, awesome. Just let us know we need to flip uh, we need to click through. Thanks, Roll, and good evening, Madam Chair, Madam Secretary, Director Golden, and members of the board. My name is Matt Eckel. I'm an attorney with Drago and Toscano, and I'm here tonight on behalf of the 28 to 30 Geneva Street team. Uh, also with me is Bill Mensinger from Embark, the project architect. Uh, if you do have any questions uh, about the project at the end of the presentation, uh, I'll be very brief tonight. Raul did a great job of summing it up. Uh, this board did see a larger version of this project about a year and a half ago, uh, which was a five-story building, 26 residential units, and 19 parking spaces. Uh, following some additional community feedback and feedback from the Zoning Board of Appeal, as Raul mentioned, uh, we did scale the project back. What you can see on the screen now is our current proposal, which is a four-story building with 19 units and 19 parking spaces. Uh, next slide, please. So again, the proposal to demolish the existing commercial structures. There are two structures which currently uh, contain a car service um, company and erect a four-story residential building with 19 condominium units and 19 interior parking spaces. The zoning district is a multifamily residential. Lot size is over 8,000 square feet. And as Raul mentioned, just under 18,000 square feet for gross square footage. Next slide. View of the surrounding neighborhood. Uh, so if you look kind of in the middle, right across from the park, that uh, single kind of raised single story structure uh, is the primary structure currently on the lot. And then to the right, there's a smaller single story structure uh, right on Geneva Street. Uh, you can see to the left, there's some open space. Some of those uh, lots have been developed into between two and four condominiums. And then on the right, there are a number of three and a half to four and a half story multifamily residential buildings. Uh, directly across the street from us is a Massport Park, which has actually been, uh, you can see it was in the process in this picture of being built out. It has been built out now, so we're directly across the street from that park. Um, next slide, please. So this is just a view looking down Geneva Street. Uh, Geneva Street is a, a private way open to public travel. Uh, part of the mitigation for this project would be a contribution to uh, street improvements. Uh, right now, as you can see, there are literally cars everywhere kind of lining the street. So as there's more uh, life brought to the street, as well as street improvements, 
Uh, we hope that this condition will, will improve. We are directly next to the airport and more uh, specifically the uh, car rental building on the airport property. Um, so this site does have a history of people parking and just walking across. Um, so we're hoping to clean all that up with this project. Next slide. And again, just existing conditions of, of what's there now with the car service uh, company. Next slide. So this was the previously approved project by this board. It was five stories, as I mentioned, 26 units and 19 parking spaces. Uh, you can go to the next slide to show the current rendering once again, which is four stories, 19 units and 19 parking spaces. We kept a lot of the design features. Um, we did get positive feedback on that. So we tried to keep that somewhat as is. Uh, the big, biggest difference just being the elimination of that fifth floor. And we now have a one-to-one -one parking ratio. Next slide, please. This is the site plan of the proposed project. Uh, you can see down at the bottom, we have a, a 10 foot curb cut allowing two way vehicular traffic. We also have uh, post and ring uh, bike racks, both inside the garage for private use, as well as um, outside for public, public use, as well as resident use. Uh, we do have a trash room, main lobby, mail room, and the 19 parking spaces previously mentioned. Next slide, please. Uh, the next couple slides are just elevations. Uh, again, you've saw, saw this in the rendering. You can see the garage there on your left side, the main entrance down the middle. Uh, we did incorporate both some common decks as well as private decks for outdoor living space. Next slide, please. And this is just the rear elevation showing the egress, showing some more of the design features as well as some of the, um, the decking that kind of spills over onto the side there. Uh, with that, I believe the only slide left is the side elevation. So I'll pause and take any questions or comments from the board. Thank you. Hey, uh, thank you for your presentation. It's definitely familiar. I remember that. So do we have any uh, questions or comments from the board? Seeing none. Uh, okay. oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. I was on mute. Just a quick one. Uh, I, I think the... Uh, dropping down a, a level it fits much nicer in with the surrounding community so uh appreciate the effort there thank you thank you great um okay a any additional questions comments hearing and seeing none a motion is in order so moved second okay roll call for a vote Ms. Rounds. aye mr monahan aye dr landsmark aye mr miller aye and the chair votes aye, motion passes. Thank you. Um, Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so <clears throat> item number 23, request authorization to adopt a minor modification to the Charlestown Urban Renewal Plan, project number mass R-55 with respect to parcel R-110 to approve an urban renewal uh, overlay district zoning designation for the Bunker Hill housing redevelopment project site to petition the Boston Zoning Commission to approve the zoning and map amendment for the master project site as an urban renewal area overlay district, to execute a development regulatory agreement with Bunker Hill Redevelopment Company, LLC, for the construction of the Bunker Hill Housing Redevelopment Project, to issue a pre preliminary adequacy determination waiving the requirement of further review pursuant to section 80B-5.4C4 of the Boston Zoning Code for the proposed master project as a mixed use development consisting of um, 1,010 BHA replacement public housing and market rate residential units, seven acres of open space, including no less than four public parks and green space areas up to 1,379 off street vehicle parking spaces up to 60,000 square feet of retail commercial space and, um, and approximately 14,000 square feet uh, or square foot community center uh, up to 2,699 on-site residential bicycle storage accommodations uh, to execute a mem memorandum of agreement with the Boston Housing Authority in connection with the proposed master project and to take all related actions. And before uh, um, 
Mr. Duverge begins the presentation. Um, I would like to notify um, the public that while this uh, this project at this meeting is um, not open to public testimony. Um, should this project move forward, um, there will be a uh, public testimony. Um, uh, it will there will be an open meeting uh, for this at the zoning board um, for anybody who, who wishes to uh, to participate in that. Should the project move forward. Um, However, I do want to say that we have um, we have received all of your letters and comments and emails, and those are included in um, every board member's packet and are reviewed uh, prior to the meeting. Um, so the presentations and um, any questioning from the board are influenced um, very much so by um, by the letters and the comments that we've received. So with that, I will hand it over to Raul. Great, thank you again, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, and good evening, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Director Golden, Madam Secretary, members of the board. Uh, as mentioned, the item and project before you is the proposed Bunker Hill Housing Redevelopment Project in Charlestown. Uh, the proposed project consists of the redevelopment of the existing BH Boston Housing Authority owned uh, Bunker Hill Public Housing Development, which is located on an approximately 26 acre site, uh, bound by Medford Street, Decatur Street, Vine Street, Bunker Hill Street, and Polk Street uh, in the Charlestown neighborhood and is currently occupied uh, by 41 buildings and 1,110 uh, publicly subsidized housing units. Uh, as you previously noted, Madam Chair, uh, the proposed master project consists of the phased demolition of the existing public housing development in the construction of a multi-phase mixed-use development comprised of up to 15 residential buildings uh, ranging in height from four to 10 stories uh, which will include 2,600, a total of 2,600, up to 2,699 residential units, of which 1,010 of those units would be BHA uh, and public housing replacement units. In addition to that, uh, the project includes approximately seven acres of open space, including no less than four publicly accessible uh, open space areas, uh, up to 1,400 vehicle parking spaces, which is a slight update from the, the description of the board agenda, approximately 50,000 square feet of retail, and other commercial space, approximately an approximately 14,000 square foot community center, and up to 2,699 on-site uh, resident bike storage spaces. Uh, this is in addition to uh, public well improvements, which include sidewalk, roadway reconstruction, and things of that nature. Uh, by way of zoning, uh, the project lies within the Charlestown Urban Renewal Area, and more specifically within the Charlestown Neighborhood Zoning District. Uh, after careful consideration and review of the project program and goals, BPDA staff felt that the Urban Renewal Overlay District uh, tool was the most appropriate zoning mechanism uh, to facilitate the redevelopment of the project site, and as such is included uh, in the board memo and is outlined in the votes. Uh, at this point, at this time, I'd like to just turn it over to my colleague, Ted Schwartzberg, who's the Charlestown uh, Neighborhood Planner. Uh, maybe if you'd like to share a few remarks from the planning uh, perspective, and then I'll uh, further uh, for the presentation with additional remarks. Thank you, Raul, Madam Chair, members of the board and Director Golden. Uh, I'm Ted Schwartzberg. I'm a senior planner at the BPDA and I'm the neighborhood planner for Charlestown. Uh, I don't often speak uh, during uh, these um, regulatory review meetings about development review. You usually see me uh, talking about planning, but uh, given the scale of this project and as Raul mentioned, it's an urban renewal project, I thought it was important to weigh in as a neighborhood planner um, you know, when we think about the, the origin stories of uh, urban renewal at the BRA, uh, those are the kind of stories that uh, motivated me to become a planner in the first place, to be a better planner. Uh, and, um, you know, this project today uh, is a great example of uh, what makes me excited to continue to do my job uh, and how we're doing the right thing and why urban renewal is so important. Um, I want to recognize that, you know, we talk about units, but this is over a thousand families, uh, very low income families are our most disadvantaged folks who live in Charlestown. Uh, and this project is an opportunity uh, to use urban renewal to provide homes uh, through the private market for these thousand and ten families. Um, in the course of the review process, uh, a 25 acre site got stakeholders thinking about planning issues at a neighborhood scale. Uh, you know, we spent many years working through public realm, urban design, open space considerations. We thought about mobility and the street network, uh, parking and how this will operate a shuttle service. Uh, we thought about climate resilience. 
Uh, you'll hear about all of that later, but uh, it was a five-year process. It's worth noting that uh, in the very first meeting we had with uh, this team in the office, my wife went into labor, uh, and uh, just earlier this evening in the beginning part of the board meeting, uh, my daughter blew out the candles on her fifth birthday cake. So um, interesting bookends on how long we've been working on these issues, and the planning work will continue. Uh, even beyond this project. Right now, uh, my colleagues and I are leading a neighborhood planning process called Plan Charlestown, where we're looking at all of these issues on a neighborhood scale in the entire square mile. Uh, and we appreciate the continued leadership of our elected leaders, uh, especially Rep. Ryan and Councillor Edwards, who support both uh, this development review process and our ongoing planning work. So the last thought I want to leave you with as the neighborhood planner uh, is the most important input is the stakeholder input. And the stakeholders that I think are most relevant here are these thousand families living uh, in uh, public housing. And uh, the Tenants Association for um, Boston Housing Authority is called the Charlestown Resident Association. The Charlestown Resident Association uh, in this whole process was represented by their own legal, legal counsel. They had their own financial consultant and they had their own architect. Uh, and this group of a thousand people um, you know, they, they commented through their vice president, Tina Goodnow, and one line that uh, Tina said that resonates with me, and this will be the last thing I say, is that the proposed project affords an historic opportunity to create a mixed income community in Charlestown that can serve as a national model for true inclusivity and celebration of residential diversity. Thank you, and I'll let the team continue from here. Great, thank you, Ted. Um, so I think just building off of Ted's point um, regarding the process and how long we've been working on this, I just want to quickly outline just a quick synopsis of the Article 80 process related to this project, and then uh, I'll turn it over to the Boston Housing Authority and the development team. Uh, so in terms of the Article 80 review process for this specific project, as Ted noted, uh, this has been a very long process. Um, it specifically formally started in September of 2016 when the development team filed a project notification form uh, with, the, uh, with the then, uh, with the BPDA. Uh, following the submission of the PNF and after a series of public meetings, the BPDA uh, issued a, a scope and determination to the proponent in June of 2017. Uh, following the issuance of that document uh, and some time after, the proponent submitted a draft project impact report to the BPDA, uh, specifically in February 2020. Uh, and that was followed up uh, with supp uh, several supplemental information filings based on the input and feedback received during the public and IAG meetings that were being held in connection with the DPIR. I think it's important to note that the submittal of the PNF and DPIR triggered multiple public comment periods that were extended on multiple occasions. Um, and during that time frame, BPDA staff, uh, BPDA staff facilitated and sponsored uh, about 15 IEG and public meetings. Uh, in addition to those meetings uh, that were facilitated by BPDA staff, the proponent also conducted extensive community outreach uh, with many abutters at Charlestown based on profit and neighborhood organizations and other local stakeholders uh, to gather as much input uh, as possible on the project. Uh, shortly before the, the board hearing started tonight, I just wanted to make note of this uh, is that state uh, State Representative Dan Ryan in the mayor's office uh, asked, submitted, uh, asked me to voice their support uh, for this proposed project. Uh, so I just wanted to inform, I just want to make sure that it was on record. Um, and before turning it over to the project team, I just want to take a quick second uh, to thank all the relevant stakeholders that were involved in the review of this project going back you know, to 2015 uh, when the BHA began its uh, RFP and disposition process. Uh, specifically, I'd like to thank the local elected delegation, uh, including may the, uh, the mayor's office, state rep Dan Ryan, and who has been involved with this project since day one, uh, and, and Council Lydia Edwards. Um, all of them have participated extensively and have advocated strongly on behalf of the community. Uh, so really appreciate that. Uh, secondly, I want to also thank Kate Bennett, Larry Dwyer, the BHA, and uh, my fellow colleagues from the BPDA um, who, who helped get this project to this important milestone, including uh, specifically including Chris Breen, uh, a colleague Ted Schwartzberg, who you just heard from, Alexa Pinard, Joe Zick, Jay Ruggiero, senior staff, and many others who assisted in the review of this proposal. I, I, I don't like to use names, but I always feel bad. I'm going to miss somebody. Um, but it was really a team effort, and I want to really take a moment to acknowledge and thank everybody for that. 
Um, and then finally, I really want to take, I wanted to acknowledge and thank the Impact Advisory Group and all the community members for the countless hours and hard work that they put into the reviews project. You know, we sometimes we didn't all agree at the same, at, we, we, don't, we don't all agree on the same things, but I think everybody is, is, their intentions are well and they all want the best for the Charlestown community. So I just want to thank everybody uh, for, for the time and effort uh, that they took uh, in place into this review of this project. So uh, at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Kate Bennett of the Boston Housing, excuse me, of the Boston Housing Authority to make a few remarks. Uh, following Kate, we'll then turn it over to Addie Grady of the project team uh, to further the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Raul, for setting that up. Um, you're amazing, and I want to thank you personally. Uh, thanks to Madam Chair, the members of the board, Director Golden, Secretary Pohemus. Um, my name is Kate Bennett, for the record, Administrator and CEO of the Boston Housing Authority. And the BHA launched this project, as Raul mentioned several years ago. I just want to uh, briefly note the, the sort of overarching goals that we really initiated this whole effort with. First and foremost, to vastly improve the quality of life for the 1,100 families that uh, live at the site and for future low-income families uh, coming to the site. To secure the future of every single deeply affordable unit uh, to transform the site to a vibrant mixed income community and really to bring significant new amenities, energy uses to the area in terms of retail and services. And so the project has really changed significantly since we began this process some years back, um, but it's really stayed true to those bedrock goals. And it's changed in particular in these last few months uh, as we really accelerated and had many more community and IAG meetings, there is no question that the project is a better project for all of that community input that has been received. And uh, the developer will talk about those impacts in a minute, but uh, I just want to thank the community, the Charlestown's Re Charlestown Residents Alliance, um, which is the elected resident organization at the site, uh, and BPDA staff for their significant time to help really shape the project. Um, BHA will, won't dis will not disappear uh, in this public-private partnership over time. We will continue to own the land. We have an oversight role. Uh, we ensure that the project will always stay true to those goals and protect the affordable housing uses and continue to stress equity and collaboration with the community um, as our electeds and as Raul noted have, have so appropriately called for. Um, we'll play a strong role in protecting the public's interest, not just for our residents, but for all residents of Charlestown going forward. And lastly, just want to note the structure of this transaction is really a, a tri-party arrangement between the developer, the BHA, and the Charlestown Residents Alliance. And so the CRA will also be a long-term steward of the process um, heading into future phases. And so I just want to thank the board for its consideration, for your service, and for your endurance. Um, and I'll turn it over to Addie Grady from the developer team. Thanks, Kate. Um, endurance is, is certainly the most important thing on the list tonight. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to bring this exciting and transformative project before you. My name is Addie Grady, and I'm a senior vice president with Leggett McCall Properties and the executive director of the project, which itself is a tri-party partnership as Kate outlined, between Leggett McCall Corcoran, the Boston Housing Authority, and the Charlestown Residents Alliance. I'm joined tonight by a number of my colleagues with the development team, as well as David Lunny of Stantec, our, arch Stantec, our architect, uh, John Copley of Copley Wolf, who represents our um, landscape architecture team. And you'll hear mostly from me, uh, but John and David are available for questions. This public-private partnership was established to redevelop and replace the Bunker Hill housing development in Charlestown. The 1100 unit housing development is the largest public housing project in New England. We will enter into 99 year ground leases with the BHA, who will continue to own the land, monitor operations and management, and continue to protect the public interest in the long term, as Kate said. 
The CRA and the residents will also play an important and active role in the project development process, as well as the ongoing property management and community center programming and services. The project before you tonight is a master plan with its first phase, that first phase being subject to further BCDC review in the near future. And we'll detail the process for advancing future phases as well. Next slide, please. Tonight, we'll review the history of the project briefly. Raul and Kate uh, already did much of that. Um, spend a little bit more time on precisely how it has changed and the principles that have guided us through these changes. I'll present the project plan and its benefits, as well as our proposed mitigation package, and outline the next steps and detail the process for advancing, advancing future phases. Next slide, please. BHA initiated this project in 2015 in response to the depreciated condition of the buildings due to decades of under, uh, under investment from HUD. The vision was to enlist private investment to compensate for the shortage of resources from HUD. And the team of Corcoran and SunCal was selected to advance this vision when they submitted the, and they submitted a project notification form in 2016. The Malega McCall team joined Corcoran not there yet, after the project was suspended due to economic infeasibility and community pressure. And together we worked with the BHA, the residents and community leaders to devise an approach that sought to balance competing interests with economic feasibility and to serve as a model for how affordable housing can leverage private investment in other projects. In February of 2020, we submitted our DPIR and commenced the public process and were quickly locked down by COVID, unfortunately. In September, we recommenced that public process, and in the four months since, we've held nine community and IAG meetings and presented before the full BCDC, BCDC Commission and subcommittee four times. Next slide, please. The project site is located in the northeast corner of Charlestown, where it is directly served by the 93 bus, and within about a 20-minute walk from two MBTA Orange Line stations on the lower left and upper left of this slide. Pre-COVID, I would walk from our office downtown to meet to meetings at the Harvard Kent School in about 30 minutes. And I understand Rep Ryan lives nearby and walks to work at the State House each day. There's good bike, bicycle infrastructure connecting the Navy Yard, which is on the right-hand side of the slide, um, right of where it says Decatur Street, to East Cambridge, connecting the Navy Yard to East Cambridge, where the Easy Ride Shuttle brings employees of many Kendall Square employers to Kendall Square for work each day. And in the Navy Yard, MGH provides shuttles connecting hospital staff and patients from Spalding Rehab to North Station and the hospital itself. The Little Mystic Greenway along the northern edge of Charlestown is being improved and interconnected by Massport and the Sullivan Square Roadway Project. And this will connect the Harbor Walk that traces most of the perimeter of Charlestown um, to, the, to the broader downtown area. Next slide, please. The site itself is comprised of over 25 acres, bounded by Bunker Hill, Medford, Polk, and Decatur Streets, and consists of 41 three-story walk-up public housing buildings, as well as a BHA office building. The project was completed in 1942 and was the first federal public housing project. The 1,100 units on site today are 100% deeply affordable and are in a state of chronic disrepair due to the lack of federal housing, federal funding to repair, repair or replace the project. Next slide, please. The existing context includes two to four and six story, scattered six story buildings along the site's edge to the south. And the residential community to the north is a uniform two stories. You can see these um, edges uh, in the upper left hand corner image as well as the lower right hand corner image. When the site was originally developed, several neighborhood streets were cut off at the property's edge, and the buildings themselves represent a brick wall that isolates the development from the surrounding neighborhood. Looking east along Bunker Hill Street in the upper right, you see where Lexington Street comes in and ends rather than connecting through to the site, through the site. The public realm of the existing development is closed off and isolating, and you can see the upper, in the upper right and lower left how the pedestrian experience along the edge of the existing development but certainly use some improvement. Next slide. 
public-private partnership came together, it was clear that this housing needed to be replaced urgently. But it was also an opportunity to do things differently, to create a mixed income community that could achieve triple bottom line goals in a meaningful way to benefit the residents and the community as a whole. From the beginning, the tri-party team has established and maintained clear guiding principles to ensure that this project would result in a successful urban redevelopment and set a new standard for equity and sustainability. These guiding principles are to build high quality replacement affordable housing with as little burden on public resources as possible to prioritize diversity, equity, and inclusion, and stand as a model for responsible development, growing a local workforce, and minimizing local impact. And to establish the places and resources that lift people up, bring people together, and ensure children grow up to realize their potential. Next slide, please. The plan for which we seek approval tonight consists of 2,699 housing units of which 1,010, or 37%, are deeply affordable public housing replacement units. 12 of the 15 buildings will be mixed income with a minimum of 22% affordable units, replacing nearly half of the public housing units without any affordable housing capital resources. Three buildings, one elderly disabled and two family buildings would replace the balance of those units and be 100% affordable we're committed to exploring ways to reduce this number to two. The plan includes seven acres of usable open space, nearly 40% of which will be organized into four interconnected, distinct publicly accessible open spaces, providing active and passive recreation for residents and the community as a whole. And the plan includes about 50,000 square feet of retail, 20% of which will be offered at affordable rents of 50% of market rate and a 14,000 square foot community center housing services and programming that will be financially supported by the project itself. Next slide, please. Calls for a variety of building heights with four stories facing residential areas and up to 10 stories in the interior of the site and toward the Tobin Bridge. Publicly accessible open space will front on Bunker Hill Street connecting to the existing neighborhood and the monumental open spaces to the south. And reconnected streets will draw the community into new open spaces in the site's interior. Next slide, please. And on Medford Street, facing a pedestrian connection into the Charles Newtown Co-op to the north, which is at the bottom of the page here. Four-story edges along Medford Street across from the Newtown development bring the project back down to the neighborhood scale and at the two easternmost buildings along Medford Street, page right here, these buildings step up to five stories across from the playing fields and adjacent to the high school. Next slide. Through the process with the BPDA staff, with BCDC and the public since the DPIR submission almost 11 months ago, the site plan has evolved in many significant ways. We have eliminated freestanding parking garages and instead spread parking into concealed garages within or beneath several buildings. We have reconfigured publicly accessible open space to enable the project to preserve more trees and to interconnect these spaces more coherently. We've reconfigured buildings to reduce the number of all affordable buildings and the number of units in those all affordable buildings and identified a specific building for elderly disabled residents that will enable a coordinated delivery of specialized services and better access to Bunker Hill Street and the bus that runs along it. We have created bike lanes. Unfortunately, they're not shown on this slide, including a two-way cycle track on Medford Street and one-way protected bike lanes on Concord and Tuff Streets to interconnect the Little Mystic Greenway <coughs> with the Navy Yard. And we hope to eventually have the opportunity to improve the area under the Tobin Bridge with a protected two-way cycle track adjacent to Chelsea Street. Bike lanes are also planned for Bunker Hill Street that would connect cyclists coming from the neighborhood streets to the south to the bike lane connections across the site. Next slide, please. And more broadly, since the filing of the project notification form, the project has evolved to reduce density from 3,200 to 2,699 units, to reduce height from 22 stories to 10, and to prioritize sustainability and resiliency alongside social equity. Next slide, please. 
With the project as proposed, this public-private partnership will replace 1,010 public housing units, create a true mixed-income community with about 50% market rate residents and 50% affordable residents. We will activate the public realm and facilitate the use of alternative modes of transportation. We'll create the largest non-state-sponsored passive house certified project in the world, as we understand it. And at full build out, we'll contribute about a little over a million dollars a year to community programming and operations, sustaining programs and services that support a healthy community. Next slide, please. With a self-funded community center that will cost approximately $7 million and a $10 million present value of the ongoing community uh, center funding, along with $8 million in open space development, 2.6 in transportation improvements, a 1.5 in affordable retail value, among other things, the total value of the public benefits is estimated to be over $36 million, and that doesn't count the benefit of the public housing replacement itself. Excuse me, next slide, please. And we have committed to an additional two and a half million in mitigation funds towards improvements to the existing project. So residents in later phases can experience improvements now. Launching a shuttle to connect the site to the orange line and park improvements, tree planting, local organization support and other community benefits. Next slide, please. Buildings F and M comprise phase one of the project. And together we'll create a surplus of replacement units to facilitate the relocation of existing residents in future phases, reducing the impact on these families' lives. This first phase will create about 200 new market rate units and 160 affordable units with a mixed income building, building F at 7822 and an all affordable building Building M. Next slide, please. Both buildings will feature residential open space and an enhanced public realm at the streets. Next slide, please. With tot lots and other recreational uses and lush green spaces. Next slide, please. Building F, a mixed income privately financed building will be built to the same level of quality and provide the same types and relative scale of amenities as the all affordable building M. Next slide, please. And from the very first phase, these buildings will improve the lives of their residents and begin to improve the public realm for the benefit of all. We've sought and heard extensive feedback from the community, the Charlestown Preservation Society, BPDA staff and BCDC on the phase one concepts you've seen here. And we've been doing a lot of work on the architecture and open space. We're excited to share this work with the community and BCDC in the coming weeks. For future phases, we'll engage in a review process with BPDA staff, RIAG, and the community to ensure consistency with the proposed plan that is before you tonight, and to demonstrate our efforts to meet our commitments to work toward further achieving social equity, environmental responsibility, and other community goals. BCDC approval and BPDA certification of consistency will be required to construct each phase. Next slide, please. Publicly accessible open space will go through a similar process in the phases in which with, in the phases, with the phases in which they'll be developed. Our goal is to complete the project in eight to 10 years, and we're committed to the hard work and ongoing community engagement that it will take to deliver this desperately needed housing in as little as little time as possible. Madam Chair, we can take some questions. Great, thank you very much for that um, very sure. thorough presentation. Um, do we have questions or comments from the board? Please. Well, I wanna say this project fills me with tremendous hope, you know, for our country really, because <clears throat> this three-way partnership represents um, ingenuity and imagination on behalf of people living better lives and um, sets an amazing precedent. Um, and I just think it is so 
hopeful. And I thank you all for working on this for so many years. And um, also that it's underscored with these very strong values, which is so important to articulate that and keep articulating that and just so appreciated. That's what we, that's what we all need is our lives and our government working around those values that you have articulated here. And it's just fantastic. I do have a question. Um, so obviously the reason this large investment is needed is because of the neglect of the housing over several decades. So can you tell us how this three-way partnership is going to keep up the capital investments needed to keep these buildings um, running well? And what is the lifespan of these buildings and what will happen at the end of the lifespan of these buildings? You know, because I assume this is a, a, a permanent uh, three-way partnership. And, you know, have you thought that far into the future and how is that going to happen? Thank you very much for that question. Um, as I as I said, that the individual uh, buildings will be on 99-year ground leases. So the relationship with the BHA is at least 99 years. <laughs> and the buildings are designed to be um, constructed out of durable materials um, that are not, um, that don't have planned obsolescence as some other uh, multifamily buildings may um, that are smaller in scale and less expensive. Um, the buildings, the projects themselves, the buildings themselves um, with their market rate um, rents will be able to fund um, the maintenance and capital improvements that are necessary to sustain um, high quality buildings that will continue to attract market rate rents. And the, the buildings that are constructed um, as 100% affordable will be done so with the low income housing tax credit program that um, also sets high standards for um, uh, maintenance and uh, capital improvements. Kate, do you have anything you want to add to that? No, I don't think so. I, I, I think that's right. The, the reserves between st structured reserves and the market rents, um, you know, it's really, um, there's an ongoing revenue stream for investment that we don't have currently. Right. I have another question, which is, um, I think this is a new approach to public housing, this public private tenant um, resident three-way partnership. Um, how is it going? <laughs> do you, do it seems to us, this looks very successful, but um, are people optimistic? Do you have strong buy-in from all parties? And, you know, can we talk about that relate the relationship a little bit? Yeah, what I would say, um, it, it's not entirely new. We, we've had some uh, redevelopment projects in the past under the HOPE 6 program that um, also had um, resident organizations that were, you know, part of the formal deal. Um, I think what's different about this one is, first of all, we have never done this much market housing before at a, at a site, you know, and where we've done a lot of mixed income, it's been a minority of market units, not, you know, two to one or, you know, one and a half to one. Um, and so it's, it's a very different project. It's a different investor profile. Um, it's a diff different type of developer team. Um, and so there's a lot of different development and deal issues, I think, than we've dealt with in the past. I think the relationship between the, tr the tri-party uh, group is is amazing. It's not to say we agree on everything. We, we spent way too much time together processing <laughs> um, issues and um, educating each other on uh, kind of where we're coming from and what's important to us and what's a deal breaker to us. Um, and we have to compromise a lot. And then 
we have to together go out to the community, which has its own concerns, um, which are valid, um, but we can't necessarily um, meet everybody's um, wishes in the community. And I think we've done a good job of, of balancing that. Um, but it's um, partnership, I would say, takes a lot of work and time. In this, in this project, it's absolutely paying off, I would say. Thank you, Carol. Yeah. Um, I, I have a question or, or maybe a, an observation. I'm fairly new to the board, and I know this has been going on for a number of years. If it was easy, it would be half done already. But it seems like you have to get very creative because of the lack of federal funds that have been coming through to housing developments throughout the country. And if the total number of units was significantly less, there might have been more buy-in by the surrounding community. But in order to achieve the 1,000 and 10 affordable or deeply affordable units, the public housing, the number of market has to be significantly higher to support that. So is that the, the fulcrum or that's what's driving the scale, the, the size of this is the offset to uh, work in the affordable units? Yeah, you've, right. you've hit the nail on the head. <laughs> it takes about three and a half um, market rate units to subsidize each affordable unit. And that's how we get to the 78-22 ratio. And we're committed and, and we're obligated, quite frankly, with our, our agreements with the BHA to try to improve that. And as market conditions improve and it, it, it um, we can demonstrate that we can um, subsidize affordable units with fewer market rate units, then we'll start to move more of the affordable units out of the all affordable buildings and into mixed income buildings. I see. So the dilemma is, if you brought the number of units down significantly, it might alleviate some of the community concerns, but then you'd not be able to replace the number of affordable units. Yeah, or with that, we would have to replace more affordable units in all affordable buildings, which has been um, a um, objection by both the residents and the community members. Sure. Understood. Thank you. Sure. I, um, I grew up in uh, public housing in Harlem that was very much like the Bunker Hill housing development. And, and a large part of the reason I ended up studying architecture was that I always thought that poor people deserved better. And I just want to thank you for producing the kind of housing and community on this site that I always knew was possible. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any further comments or questions? A quick question, Kate. This, this model, though, this model's been around. What was the first one? Was it Mission Maine? Mission Maine and, and Orchard uh, were about the same time. 25 years ago? Um, I remember Mission Maine. More, it was more, than, more than 20, between 20 and 25. Yeah, yeah. I'd, have to, I'd have to go back. and. I get the math. I understand the model. I, I would rather it the old way. We lost a lot of jobs with the housing authority. A lot of electricians used to work for BHA that don't anymore. And I get it, though. I understand the math. It's, it's pretty simple. The federal government's not investing in housing. So here we are. So it's privatization of public housing in a sense. And um, and we no longer get those jobs. But again, that was just, uh, <clears throat> I get it. I mean, uh, Brian, you remember, I mean, first it was D Street, now Old Colony, and uh, Bobby Dunham and Gizzy and, of course, Touchy. And, the, you know, those were great jobs that are gone. But uh, again, I understand. I get it. <clears throat> yeah, it's, I, I, I hear you. It, it, we, we actually have never laid anybody off. We, we absorb everyone from these sites, but, but that doesn't mean that, that there isn't a reduction overall, um, the right. Okay. Um, any additional comments or questions? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think my fellow board member, Dr. Landsmark, um, kind of said it, said it all. 
um, people, all people, um, you know, deserve housing. Um, and I think we've done a lot of that today. Um, and again, very, very excited, very hopeful, um, like uh, Treasure Down, um, that, you know, this is, this is the experiment that's worth, that's worth it worth the time, worth the energy, worth the money, you know, worth however long the board meetings like have to be, right? Um, and, and thank you to the staff um, and over the years <laughs> um, who have worked who have worked on this project. I am very glad and proud um, that, you know, Raul, you took the, the time to name names and, um, you know, uh, the whole five-year-old has grown up, you know, um, through, uh, through this, this project. And I, 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 I do know the character of, um, of the people who, who serve, um, this agency, um, and who, you know, serve in our, our fellow agencies and, and, and for what it's worth, um, I thank you and I trust you. Um, and we've got work to do to, um, you know, to communicate and to convey that um, to uh, to the residents of Boston, um, and that um, yeah, that this is this is all this is all worth it, and and you know, for us to become the city um, that I know that we are. So, um, with that, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you, Thank you. so much. Thank you. On to the zoning commission. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So moving on to item number uh, 24, uh, request authorization to adopt 10th report and decision amendment to the Landmark Center Chapter 121A project approving the transfer of said 121A project from the from Landmark Center Owner Limited Partnership to ARE MA Region Number 88 Holding Limited Partnership and ARE MA Region Number 87 Owner Owner Limited Partnership and the approval of all related matters. Um, Ms. Carr, I know the details were in the board. Is there anything else in the board memo? Is there anything else you want to um, add? For we, we do have remarks prepared, Madam Chair. Um, we're happy to share those. I know it's been a long evening, so I would defer to your judgment on that. Okay. Um, uh, do we have any questions or comments from the board related to this one? I know it's... Ashling, how, how long is your presentation? I have probably two or three minutes, okay, Madam let's, Secretary. Let's, yeah, let's see, let's let's go for it. Okay, great. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Madam Secretary, Director Golden, members of the board. Good evening. The Landmark Center Chapter 121A project is located at 401 Park Drive and 201 Brookline Avenue in the Fenway neighborhood of Boston. The original project approved under the Landmark Center 121A project in 1996 consisted of the rehabilitation of the former C's, Sears catalog, excuse me, warehouse building into a mixed-use development containing approximately 921,740 square feet, including office institutional space, retail space, public space, and approximately 67,000 square foot cinema complex, approximately 10,000 square foot daycare center, approximately 27,500 square foot health club, and approximately 43,000 square, square feet of service and loading areas. In 2014, the Sixth Amendment to report and decision for the project allowed for the conversion of surface parking into approximately 1.1 acres of open space, which increased the total amount of open space on the site to 2.2 acres. This same amendment allowed for renovations and re-merchandising of the ground floor retail space along Park Drive and Brookline Avenue to include new restaurants and a destination food hall and other interior office and garage renovations. This portion of the project is referred to as phase one. In 2017, the Ninth Amendment to report and decision for the project approved the construction of a new approximately 506,000 square foot office research and development laboratory building along the Fullerton Street side of the building and related streetscape and site improvements, including a public plaza. 
This portion of the project is referred to as phase two and is currently under construction. Between the sixth and ninth amendments for the project, the project site was subdivided between the original project, including phase one, located at 401 Park Drive, and phase two, located at 201 Brookline Avenue, which delineated ownership of the project between Landmark Center Owner Limited Partnership and Landmark Center Development Limited Partnership. This 10th Amendment to report and decision on the Landmark Center 121A this evening approves a transfer of the Landmark Center Chapter 121A project from Landmark Center Owner Limited Partnership and Landmark Center Development Limited Partnership to ARE MA Region Number 87 Owner Limited Partnership and ARE MA Region Number 88 Holding Limited Partnership. ARE MA Region Number 88 Holding Limited Partnership will own 401 Park Drive. The ultimate beneficial owner of 100% of the membership interests will be Alexandria Real Estate Equities, a national real estate investment trust which is publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange as ARE. ARE MA Region Number 87 Owner Limited Partnership will own 201 Brookline Avenue. The owner of 100% of the membership interests will be ARE MA Region Number 87 LLC, a joint venture between a wholly owned subsidiary of Alexandria, which will own an approximately 95% interest in Fenway Enterprises 201 Brookline Avenue LLC, an affiliate of Samuels and Associates, which will own up to an approximately 5% interest. In connection with the transfer, the developer has been working with the assessing department and will provide a contribution to the city, which represents updated payments under the 6A contract. There will be no changes to the project or in the uses of the project as previously approved in connection with this transfer. The Landmark Center 121A project expires in March of 2022, and the project will comply with all regulations under Chapter 121A until its expiration. Should the board have any questions, we are joined this evening by Peter Sugarides, Doug Hussied, and Bill Dillon on behalf of Samuels and Associates, and Hunter Cass, Dante Angelucci, and Rebecca Lee on behalf of Alexandria Real Estate Equities. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And apologies, Ms. Kerr. Is it the next one that typically doesn't have a presentation? So, um, but do we have any questions from the board? Okay, hearing, hearing and seeing none. Uh, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Transfer that land. Great, thank you. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Good night. Um, item number 25, request authorization to issue a certificate of completion to the Council of Elders Housing Corporation for the 2875 Washington Street project known as the Council Tower located on parcel um, I-8 in the Washington Park Urban Renewal Area, project number Mass R-24. Um, Chris, do you, yep. any uh, presentation that we could, we could? Really quick. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair, Director Golden, members of the board, Madam Secretary, my name is Chris Breen, Urban Renewal Manager here at the BPDA. Before you is a vote authorizing the director to issue a certificate of completion evidencing the successful completion of the Council Tower project located at 2875 Washington Street, AKA parcel I-8 in the Washington Park Urban Renewal Area. The original project constructed as a Chapter 121A project was developed pursuant to a land disposition agreement under the 1984 deed from the BRA to the Council of Elders to create a 17-story building with 144 subsidized units for elders with eight accessible units for available for elders and those under the age of 62 with disabilities on a 211,000 square foot lot. All tower applicants must have incomes at or below the 50% median income for the area. Building amenities include live in staff, workers, uh, roof deck, and a computer learning center. Last month, the proponent submitted a request for this certificate of completion because no previous vote could be located. Uh, staff did a site visit confirming the project has been constructed or completed as approved. And thus, we are recommending the issuance of a certificate of completion today. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. Okay, thank you, Chris. Uh, any questions or comments from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. 
Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Chris. All right. Here we go. Uh, item number 27 has been removed. So we're on to item number 28, contractual. I need a motion to pay our bills. I move to pay our bills. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs. Aye. Mr. Monahan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Please pay the bills. Final item, director's update. Director Golden, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair, and through you to the members. Uh, good evening. Uh, before I, I get started, I want to acknowledge and state the obvious. I'm hoping we have an opportunity to reflect a little more on uh, the legacy of Mayor Marty Walsh. Um, uh, he'll be with us for a few more weeks, so I s expect to say a bit more at the next board proceeding, but I just want to say right now, how grateful I am, how grateful we are at this organization to have benefited from his leadership uh, at a key period in the, in the, in the complicated uh, history of Boston recently. Um, he, was, he was just the right person for the times and uh, I'll certainly be missing him. Uh, I think we all are, but, but uh, he, he was, uh, a good leader. He was a strong leader. He provided humane, civil, respectful direction at all times in the work that we did. And, and he's allowed us, enabled us, encouraged, insisted that we do good work that continues to bear fruit for the people of Boston for generations to come. Boston is a much better place because of the seven years he served it as its mayor. And uh, I wish him well. Um, and I uh, look forward to speaking more about um, Mayor Walsh before he actually departs uh, for Washington. So he's belonged to us for a long time. Now he brings those same gifts, that same healthy, balanced, respectful temperament to Washington, D.C. So now the nation benefits the way we have. Um, and so I'm happy uh, for the country, even though it is uh, sad to see him leave this building in the coming weeks. The slide you're looking at now tells a really compelling story. And the slide you're looking at right now tells a story similar to the stories that were told the prior six years. Uh, there's been a whole lot of good that has flowed uh, under the Walsh administration uh, from our efforts in planning, our efforts in real estate development, land disposition, and ultimately workforce development, which of course derives a lot of its funding from real estate development. But, but just look at those numbers simply and succinctly um, portrayed on that slide. Uh, a few weeks ago, we actually published the BPDA's year-end summary, and, and those are the highlights. 15.8 million square feet of new development worth more than $8.5 billion, uh, 10,000 residential units, including almost 3,000 income-restricted units, representing 27% of all housing units approved by this board last year, 27%. Um, that helps us solidify Boston's position as the major American city with the highest percentage of income restricted housing. That, 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 is, that is quite a statistic. It's an important one. It speaks to our commitment to take care of Bostonians all along the socioeconomic spectrum. Over $5.4 million was generated in new inclusionary development policy, affordable housing funds from development that again are poured into the creation of affordable housing. Over $43 million 
from last year's permanent development will be generated to support affordable housing through linkage and over eight million dollars in linkage fees will support job training programs in Boston. And, and, and to drill down on that for a moment, we expect to spend $15 million a year this year on job training through the Office of Workforce Development, which we oversee, $15 million. But that $15 million is leveraged with $30 million of other funding that will provide job training, workforce development, um, services to 15,000 vulnerable Bostonians. And when you think of the jobs that have been lost in COVID and, and the people who have lost those jobs, those, those are vulnerable folks. And, and this investment in human capital will pay dividends and help the most vulnerable among us as we turn out of uh, the COVID-induced uh, public health disaster and economic disaster. And I think we're all so proud that the work we do is helping to address the needs of that hurting population. And finally, uh, 35,000 jobs from all that development, both construction and permanent jobs, 35,000 jobs uh, for people to care for themselves and their families. And when we talk about methodologies, last year, we learned to do everything anew uh, 330 community meetings took place uh, with regard to our external planning and development mission. 330 meetings and 220 of them were done virtually. So when you look at all those numbers up there, most of those numbers were rooted in building consensus in our neighborhoods through digital virtual means. That was all brand new to us. Uh, but when we talked about it this morning, I briefed the mayor on this slide and he said, man, for all the difficulties thrown at us in 2020, the BPDA, BPDA staff never missed a beat and continued to deliver really good things to the people of Boston. So that's what that slide tells you. And, and, and the means by which we did it was, was really extraordinary. So, I want to thank every single one of our staff who, despite the incredible challenges of COVID-19 in 2020 and in 2021, um, continue to do uh, work that will positively impact the lives of Bostonians for many years to come. Uh, next. A couple tweets about some important legislation uh, that has, when, when, when this slide was prepared, the legislation was passed by the legislature awaiting the government's governor's signature on some really important legislation that affects the work that we do. My understanding is during this meeting, during this meeting that we're conducting right now, the governor signed the legislation. So it's now law, this isn't pending any longer. Uh, Last week, the legislature passed really significant legislation that Mayor Walsh proposed that strengthens both our inclusionary development policy and our linkage programs. That's the benefit funding that flows from commercial office development. The inclusionary development policy, of course, is uh, the creation of affordable units or funding for affordable units that flows from market rate residential development. Uh, these are critical tools we use to create affordable housing and fund workforce development programs that I just men mentioned. The bill, now law, that will do two things. First, it allows us more flexibility to adjust the required payment and program guidelines for linkage payments by commercial developments. Previously, this agency was only allowed to adjust linkage every three years based solely on the consumer price index. Any other legislative changes or any other changes in the program required specific legislative approval. Then the problem with that is the CPI, the consumer price index doesn't really track the value and the growth in value associated with commercial office space in the city of Boston. So we were losing the potential 
to, to capture uh, a bit more of that value for a linkage, uh, the law now allows us uh, to go a little further. Really important in addressing, again, the needs of vulnerable populations that linkage, um, that linkage helps through affordable housing and job training. Second, the legislation, now law, will also allow us to codify the inclusionary development policy, our affordable housing policy, into the Boston Zoning Code. Currently, IDP is an executive order uh, from the mayor, and it applies to projects only, projects that need zoning relief are our on city or BPDA property. As we continue our comprehensive planning studies and contemplate updates to our existing zoning, more market rate residential developments may become as of right and be exempt from IDP requirements because they don't need zoning variances. Zoning variances are the trigger to securing IDP affordable units. This law now allows us to strengthen IDP as a strategy to capture affordable housing units and funding for affordable housing from projects that are both compliant with zoning as well as those that need zoning relief. This, this opens up uh, a new world to us of opportunities to grow our affordable housing stock. Finally, I want to say a special word of thanks and congratulations and wish a colleague of ours well as he heads into retirement tomorrow. There's our friend John Campbell who has worked with us for 20 years. Tomorrow is his last day with the agency. John began his career at the BPDA as a project housing assistant in housing compliance and then he became a project manager in the development review department in 2012 before ultimately becoming a senior project manager. John was born and raised and still lives in his beloved neighborhood of Charlestown. Uh, he started out at Boston Latin School with me many years ago. Um, we entered the school on the same day. And ultimately, John graduated from Boston University. Uh, John's body of work ranges from private development projects in South Boston to public housing redevelopments in Roxbury. He's helped to expand social services housing in Dorchester. Uh, because of his efforts to ensure compliance with our affordable housing IDP policy and by overseeing uh, permitting processes for over 80 developments in the city, which resulted, by the way, in the creation of almost 2,400 residential units in our neighborhoods as a result of his efforts. John has made Boston truly a better place for all his, his work for 20 years has led to jobs, housing creation, new taxes that tax revenues that support the high quality of life we have in Boston, uh, the protection of affordable units, new open space. He brought a better quality of life to people throughout our neighborhoods. Um, uh, late last year, John, as you may recall, was the recipient of the Henry Shattuck Award. Uh, it's a public service award. It's the Academy Award of Public Service, and it's an honor that was justly deserved by John, and we were thrilled to celebrate that recognition uh, with him. John Campbell has helped create one of the great cities of the world and to pre prepare it and the people of Boston for a better future. So thank you, John Campbell, for your profound service to the BPDA and to the people of Boston. I'll miss you, we'll all miss you, and we wish you a long, 
happy, healthy retirement. Take care, John. Godspeed. Uh, with that, actually, we want we want to just take a moment to applause. Uh, audibly Thank applause. You, John. John. Congratulations, Sean. And uh, with that, uh, I wish you a good night, and I look forward to visiting with you again virtually in February. Thanks so much. Good night. Good night, Dr. Director Golden. Um, okay. Um, I need a motion to adjourn this meeting. I move we adjourn this meeting. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone, and we'll see you next month. Stay safe. Good night, everybody.